and we're live. Okay, well, welcome everyone to our fall meeting of the Joint Committee on the Chesapeake Bay and Atlantic Coastal Bay's Critical Area uh, meeting. We would much rather all be in person together in Annapolis. And we even had some very big and exciting plans to do a site visit that would have required members to get their shoes and their hands a little dirty as we uh, explored in person the issues that we are going to be discussing today. Um, but we're happy that we still have an opportunity to have this discussion and be briefed by our friends at the Critical Area Commission of the Chesapeake Bay Commission, and lastly, the uh, good folks at DLS to talk about a variety of issues. It's a jam-packed agenda, and I'm very excited to get started. And with that, I'll turn it over to my, my uh, partner in this effort, to, uh, Chair Dana Stein. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Elfrith. Um, uh, I'd also like to welcome everyone to the, the annual meeting of of the joint committee and appreciate everyone being here virtually. And uh, since we can't be present um, in the same in the same room together, um, you know, it always seems that the critical area commission is on the front lines of- Thank you, thank you, Senator Elfrith. Um, it, it, it's always on the front lines of key environmental issues, be it development, erosion and solar. And so those are several of the topics that the commission will be addressing and also welcome as well the uh, Chesapeake Bay Commission and Department of Legislative Services. So um, again, thanks for everyone um, joining us today. Thank you. We couldn't be to, in, together in person, but the, the issues of importance did not cease because of the pandemic. And frankly, they're only of, of greater importance. So with that, uh, we have the, the good folks in the Critical Area Commission here with us. Uh, the chair, Mr. Deegan, is here. Uh, Kate Charb Charbonneau, I think I got that right, um, uh, the executive director, as well as Emily, Nick, and Charlotte to talk to us about solar farms, water-dependent facilities, um, and trees. So please take it away. Good, after <clears throat> Good afternoon, Senator Alfred and Delegate Stein and esteemed members of the committee. Uh, I, too, uh, would much rather be in person, but these are the times we live in. It's my pleasure to appear before you today and to update you on the recent activities of the Critical Area Commission. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to introduce the staff uh, one more time. I have with me today our Executive Director, Kate Charbonneau, our Regulations and Mapping Coordinator, Lisa Herger, and our two Regional Program Chiefs, Nick Kelly and Charlotte Sharon. Also with us today is the Assistant Attorney General that represents the Critical Area Commission, uh, Emily Venturi. Uh, together, we will provide you an overview of our work <clears throat> this past year on critical area mapping, critical area regulations, including our newly proposed solar energy regulations and a section on enforcement activities. Um, as you know, it's been a challenging year, and I want to make sure we take just a, a moment to acknowledge my staff again for their work. Back in March, you know, the world turned upside down for us, and all our staff transitioned into working from home. Within days, they had set up new procedures and to go virtually and, and take in all our projects and manage their workloads uh, virtually. And within two months, we were able to move our 29 member commission to do virtual meetings on, on a platform. And uh, as I've learned, this is like one of your first ones uh, that you're doing this session. Uh, Try doing with 29 commission members and holding votes. I guess you'll get to that soon. Our, our staff of uh, 16 is not, not only providing the same level of excellent customer service, but I would argue that they're even more accessible than they were before. Um, uh, we, you know, we remain committed to providing our, our same tools and resources to our local jurisdictions. And if nothing, I think we would probably go a little closer to them. Although it's awful hard to get hold of a staff member because they're always in a meeting virtually or on the phone. So sometimes our, our days go longer now than they were before. It's kind of, it's just the way it works, but, uh, you know, I'm very proud of what they've done and what we've accomplished over this last eight months. Uh, so at this time, I'd like to uh, ask Kate Charbonneau 
to begin their, our little presentation. And actually, Mr. Chairman, if you don't mind interrupting, I just wanted uh, on behalf of Mr. Alfred to acknowledge the other committee members who are here. We have Senator Hedelman, Senator Simon Ayers, Senator Salling, and uh, Elgin Clark. And hopefully I didn't miss any other uh, legislator who's here, but thank you. Thank you to the committee members. Sorry about that, Mr. Chairman. Right. But thank you. Kate, you ready? Thank you, Chairman Deegan. Um, if we could load up the presentation, we do have a few slides um, just to track uh, the topics we will be covering. Okay, I'm working on getting that up now. I'm sorry about the delay. So please bear no with me. No worries. Um, while that's coming up, I can get started. Um, good afternoon, Senator Elfreth, Delegate Stein, and members of the committee. My name is Kate Charbonneau, and I am the Executive Director of the Critical Area Commission. Um, I too would like to reiterate Chairman Deegan's comments regarding Commission staff and how well they have pivoted and performed this year. As you will see today, when you hear from some of my colleagues, I work with a fantastic team and they make my job honestly pretty easy. Um, so I'm very proud of, of how they've been able to transition this past year. And if you, any progress, oh, here we go. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> Is there a PowerPoint? Yes. Okay, ah, there we go, okay. Um, and we can go to the second slide actually. So as you know, um, the General Assembly approved the Critical Area Act in 1984, establishing the Critical Area Commission. Our role is one of oversight and coordination. We work with the 64 local jurisdictions who are directed by the Critical Area Act to implement their own local critical area programs to ensure they are doing so in compliance with the law and regulations. We strive to work cooperatively with our local government partners and to provide the best possible technical, educational, and legal assistance as needed. As the chairman noted, today's briefing will highlight where we are with our critical area boundary mapping updates and regulatory updates, as well as try to give you a broad overview of enforcement in the critical area. We sent over a few handouts in advance of today's meeting. Um, one is a joint memo from Chairman Deegan and myself that's answering the supplementary topics which you had inquired about. We also provided copies of the final regulatory proposals for surface mining and for agriculture and the draft regulatory proposal for renewable energy. And finally, you should have a handout with a chart that is related to the solar energy regulations portion of today's presentation. Next slide. Okay, wait a minute. <laughs> So we continue to work on updating every local critical area map based on current shoreline data. Um, and this initiative has been ongoing since uh, the law was amended in 2008. Um, the Eastern Shore Regional GIS Cooperative is doing this work uh, for us and they really are a fantastic partner. Um, and despite you know, the challenges of the last year, we have made significant progress in 2020. The dark green counties represent those that have formally updated critical area maps. So this includes Talbot County, Queen Anne's County, Caroline County, Baltimore County, and Baltimore City, which was finalized just last month, as well as Prince George's County and Calvert County. Um, the lighter green counties, which include Kent, St. Mary's County, Harford County, and Anne Arundel are currently in their two year adoption window so this means that we've provided a map that they can adopt locally um, and they have up to two years to do that. Once that step is complete, then those maps are considered final. Um, so Kent County and St. Mary's County are nearing the end of their two year window and we expect uh, their adoption to be final soon. Um, and, and before we send a map to a local jurisdiction uh, for adoption, we go through a pretty um, intensive public information process. Um, Lisa Herger will speak next here in a second to talk about how we've transitioned uh, those meetings this year. 
Um, but as of right now, Charles County is just entering this phase and we are in final preparation to enter that phase with Harper, uh, with Cecil County. Um, and then all of the yellow counties on the lower shore are still in what we call the data processing uh, phase. So we are still reviewing shorelines and wetlands and um, we wanna make sure that those maps are as accurate as possible. And so this past year, um, we have been able to proceed with doing field work to confirm those data points, but uh, we're still in that data processing stage. And I'm now going to ask uh, Lisa Herger to move on to the next slide and talk to you a little bit more about um, our mapping at work. Thank you, Kate. Uh, my name is Lisa Herger and I am the mapping and regulations coordinator for the commission. Um, as Kate mentioned a little bit earlier and also Chairman Deegan, um, given the pandemic this year and all of the upheaval, um, we have had to change the method by which we provide information to the public regarding map updates. Typically, prior to delivering what we call the summary draft maps to a local government that they will approve as their updated critical area boundary maps, um, we do what we call public meetings, which are informal. They're not required by the law, but we like to do them before we do an official delivery. Um, and we used to hold those in, in person, um, but since we're not able to do that, um, we've updated our website, which you can see on the right-hand side of your screen, um, to provide a video on YouTube that folks can um, click on and they get the exact same presentation that we would have provided to them in person. One is by um, the Eastern Shore Regional GIS Cooperative. And then I am also part of that uh, presentation to introduce people to the critical area and how that might affect them going forward in the future if their property is now in the critical area. We used to meet with people in person. We had individual staff members with their own laptop and people would sit right next to us and we'd look at their individual properties. Um, obviously we can't do that now. So we've also provided on our website a place where they can reach us. Um, Chairman Deegan sends out a letter to the folks that have a 1% or greater increase in their property, which has our phone numbers, our email addresses, and we are getting responses to those um, just like we would in a, a typical in-person meeting. So that's how things have changed for us um, over this past, I guess, eight or nine months. Um, and we believe that that's working fairly smoothly um, with the jurisdictions where we've had to transition um, to this format. Um, currently, jurisdictions that are in this virtual public meeting phase are um, Charles County, including the town of Indian Head that's within Charles County. Um, and then we hope to have uh, the county of, let's see, Cecil County, um, we hope to have in the public meeting phase within the next month or so. In fact, we had a meeting with their staff this morning. Um, and within Cecil County, We've completed the, the town of Northeast, um, but we hope to be in virtual public meeting space um, with um, Charlestown, Elkton, and Perryville, um, and Chesapeake City. So we have like five jurisdictions within Cecil County, and they're all in a various stage of either virtual public meeting or we're getting ready to deliver those maps officially to those jurisdictions. Um, the map that Kate showed earlier with the different colors, you might notice that the lower shore was all yellow. Um, so Dorchester and Somerset counties, um, those jurisdictions, we have completed our site visits. We were able to do that during the pandemic. Um, we had been granted special permission to go out in the field, provided we were distanced, masked up, even though we were, we were outside. Um, and we were able to keep moving forward with those site visits. So we plowed ahead in those two counties. We had quite a bit on our list, as you might imagine, um, for the lower counties that have a lot more wetlands um, issues. And the next step is to work with the county staffs to prepare those maps where there may have been an expansion with the thousand foot boundary and give them designations. And once we complete that, they'll be ready for their virtual meeting phase. So we're hoping that those two counties that are in yellow there will be ready for virtual public meetings, hopefully in the winter time after Christmas. Um, and then the final two counties on the very lower shore, uh, Wicomico, well, not exactly, but Wicomico and Worcester counties, we're still in the initial mapping of their current shoreline and wetland edges. 
Um, and we believe that we'll be able to do site visits provided we're given permission um, in those counties probably after the holidays. So we're, we're still planning ahead um, and hopefully, you know, working around hunting season two, um, we'll be out there. So the lower shore is moving along despite the fact they are yellow. So that's the status of the counties um, at the moment. And now I'm gonna turn it back over to Kate um, who's going to talk to you about coastal erosion. Thank you, Lisa. Um, if we could go down one more slide. Um, I just want to touch a moment on, uh, obviously, we are seeing as part of this mapping update loss of wetlands and coastal erosion. Um, and this has been an issue that the, the commission has recognized now for a number of years, um, beginning back in 2014. Uh, the Commission updated its regulations uh, regarding state development projects to require that those projects in the critical area consider the impacts of climate change and sea level rise and to incorporate coastal resilience measures. Um, we are also a member of the Coastmark Council and um, as a result, we are able to assist with sort of compliance with those measures when it's required to, you know, obviously Projects in the critical area are going to have to look to those Coastmark um, uh, siting and design guidelines. Um, and then we also can encourage incorporation of the Coastmark siting and design guidelines when it's not required as part of that legislation. Um, but really, it's one of the bigger areas that we continue to work with is um, trying to find ways to help our local partners also improve their coastal resiliency at the local level, depending upon their needs. Um, so back in 2016, we developed some guidance, um, which our staff continues to use with their local jurisdictions to help them identify ways they can amend their local programs to um, address flooding or erosion or related coastal resilience issues. Um, in fact, uh, one sort of, I'm going to claim a little bit of success for this, obviously, though I think it belongs to the town of Oxford. Um, Recent, you know, we they were a model town for us when we developed that guidance in 2016, and uh, we identified a, a number of different provisions to amend within their local critical area program to help manage um, some of the flooding that the town was seeing. So it, it increased stormwater management. Um, we increased tree planting within the critical area, and we managed some of the plantings at the shoreline as part of their um, development regulations. And Cheryl Lewis, the town clerk, has often told me that she uses and describes that effort um, when she's making grant applications as a way to demonstrate the town's commitment to addressing these critical issues. Um, I don't know if you all noticed, but two days ago, uh, the town learned and it was published that they had received in partnership with Maryland Department of Natural Resources, a $2.8 million grant from NOAA and other partners to implement the Shoreline Protection Master Plan. So, that's a significant step forward for the town. And obviously um, that shoreline protection master plan is going to um, provide them uh, some significant results and more than perhaps our critical area changes did. But I think being able to demonstrate that this is an issue and that a town or a county is cognizant and can make small changes um, can lead to bigger changes. If we can move down to the next slide um, at this point, I want to transition into talking about our regulations and what we've been doing in that arena. Um, so uh, one of the things the commission has been working on now for a number of years is just making what we call regular updates to our regulations in order to bring them up to current drafting standards um, since they were originally drafted in 1985. So this would include, you know, correcting citations, um, using current language and clarifying meaning where it's necessary. Um, so earlier in the year, the commission approved updates to chapter seven, which is our surface mining regulations. And these were published as final in June of this year. Um, these regulations lay out the policies that local jurisdictions use in considering applications for sand and gravel mines, as well as the criteria these operations are required to follow in the critical area, um, including decommissioning plans. The commission also approved updates to chapter six, our agriculture chapter. Um, we'll be submitting those updates for publication early next year. And then like the surface mining chapter, 
the updates were made in order to use current drafting standards, as well as to clarify meaning and intent of the existing requirements in conformance with um, existing agricultural regulations of the Maryland Department of Agri Agriculture. And then uh, finally, we have been working on, um, but we, the commission has not yet voted on updates to chapter three, which is our water dependent facility chapter. Um, so these updates will be similar in that the intent is to use current language, correct citations, and to clarify meaning of existing provisions. So we expect to continue working on these, those updates in 2021, um, and we can provide uh, more information on, on those provisions as well. Um, so at this point, I'm going to hand this back to Lisa to provide you some more information about the renewable energy proposal as this was really our um, area of interest this year. Thank you, Kate. I wanted to start out before we kind of give you a little bit more details regarding the actual draft that is in the hands of the AELR committee, actually. Um, what we did or what our process is, if you will, before we put a pen to paper with regulations. Our process is before we even start, um, we get the idea and then we start to think about who knows more about this than us? Um, who do we need to coordinate with um, because it might affect um, them from a regulatory standpoint or who is gonna have an interest in it? So on the slide that you have in front of you is pretty much the comprehensive list of all the folks that we talked to. Um, and I wanna take this opportunity um, to thank all the stakeholders um, that are listed here and all the time and effort um, they provided to us over the past probably three years, um, providing in, input and feedback. It was highly valuable to us. Um, we had a lot to learn about renewable energy ourselves um, and then figure out how to make it all work. So. We met multiple times with staff from the Public Service Commission, um, the Department of Natural Resources Power Plant Research Program, obviously the Maryland Energy Administration, MAKO, MML, all of our local governments who would be affected, uh, the Maryland Farm Bureau, and all of our state agency partners who are represented on the Critical Area Commission. Um, Chairman Deegan assigned a work group of commission members that included designees from the Department of Natural Resources, Department of Agriculture, and the Department of Planning. And uh, we also, finally, we coordinated with the Chesapeake Bay program, the Eastern Shore Land Conservancy, um, CBF, the Chesapeake Conservancy, and uh, a local group uh, contacted me and, and wanted to participate. Um, it's a group out of uh, Southern Anne Arundel County. They're called the Advocates for Herring Bay. So they were very helpful in providing us some feedback, particularly on the planting aspects that we'll talk about in a minute. So the Critical Area Commission actually met last Thursday, a week ago, and they voted to allow staff to begin the formal regulation adoption process. So the regulations are currently under review, as I mentioned before, by the AELR committee. Um, and we are expected to publish the regulations in the register um, in the December 18th edition. So that's the status now. Um, so I skipped from coordination, which started about three years ago, all the way to last week, which was we were given permission by the 29 member Critical Area Commission to begin the formula, formal adoption process. Excuse me. The next slide, please. So I'm going to give you a very um, brief overview, and my colleagues are going to help me out too, it's not going to be just me talking, about these regs and how, how they work. So over three years ago, Chairman Deegan asked commission staff to research possible regulations to align with, as you all know at the time, um, new renewable energy provisions that are in the state law. So we're talking about the renewable energy portfolio, and as you recall, I guess it wasn't last session, but or maybe it was last session. I'm starting to lose track of time. Um, when the, um, the portfolio numbers were tweaked and now there's a, a higher carve out, particularly for solar at 14, 14%, I think it is 14.9 or 5%. So this request even three years ago was timely since staff were receiving inquiries about whether 
specifically the larger scale, so the industrial commercial scale solar projects, we're not talking about the residential ones, was an allowable use in the critical areas resource conservation area. So real quickly, in the critical area, there's three land use designations and, they, and in most jurisdictions, they act as overlays over existing local zoning. They include the intensely developed areas, limited development areas and resource conservation areas. Um, intensely developed areas, to give you an idea, are places like Baltimore City, City of Annapolis, some of our smaller jurisdictions that have a lot of dense, um, densely developed urbanized areas. The LDAs are more like suburban areas and the resource conservation areas, which make up 80% of the entire critical area statewide, um, are comprised of our farms, our wetland areas, our forested areas, our open space, and low density residential. And the very, um, the other thing to recall about the resource conservation area is our regulations limit the types of uses that are allowed in the resource conservation area, which typically do not include industrial commercial type uses. So our focus is mainly on resource conservation areas in the critical area, although the regulations will apply more broadly also to the IDAs and the LDAs, and we'll talk about that in a minute. To date, there's been no large scale projects proposed or constructed in the resource conservation area. So I wanted to have that out there so you're aware of that. When we research the potential for solar energy projects in the RCA and in the critical area, we became concerned that the process that would be available to allow these types of uses under our current regs, which would generally be using growth allocation, isn't the right process. And that we needed to come up with another way to accommodate these large solar projects in the critical area. Um, because growth allocation was designed by the General Assembly way back when, generally to address traditional types of development and not this type of use that we hadn't envisioned, you know, back in the late 80s and early 90s when the law took effect. So we believe that renewable energy is um, potentially significant or can be in the critical area, but it's not traditional development. Um, and also, um, there was a recent decision by the Court of Appeals that you may be familiar with called the perennial solar decision, which confirmed that the Public Service Commission's preemption authority was still a valid thing, um, which means that regardless of local planning or even potentially um, our regulations, which were incorporated into local ordinances, um, could potentially be preempted. So in other words, if a solar developer came in and wanted to put a solar project in the RCA, um, regardless of whether or not that was allowed, it could still go there um, because the PSC has that preemption authority. So if that were to happen, we wanted to be sure that with these regulations, there would still be provisions built in to protect the interest and the integrity of the resource conservation area that's in the statute. Um, so Chairman Deegan um, asked that we do a more simpler streamlined process outside of the growth allocation process um, so we closely coordinated with the Public Service Commission and all of our local government partners. And the process advances, so it does a couple things, it advances the state's renewable energy goals, um, and it provides a sounder justification for um, local governments and their concerns before the Public Service Commission, and also trying to, again, protect the critical area resources. So we're trying to strike a balance between the state's renewable energy goals, the critical area goals, and local interests. The proposed regulations, as I said, are currently under review by the AELR committee, and they're the result of a very intense process um, with all the stakeholders that you saw on the previous slide, um, and also with the work group of commission members that the chairman convened to assist our staff. We believe that they do achieve a balance in protecting the land and water resources of the critical area while recognizing the authority of the Public Service Commission. Um, and finally, it maintains some ability for local jurisdictions to adopt if they, if they believe so or is appropriate for their local government or their, their counties or jurisdictions um, stricter standards if they wish to do so in their local comprehensive planning. So next slide, please. So I'm just going to give you a, a real brief outline um, and then I'm going to turn it over to my colleague to talk to you about um, the forest clearing provisions. So for the purposes of these regs, we defined projects that would require a certificate of public convenience and necessity as major projects. So major projects 
are defined in these regulations as greater than two megawatts. So they have to go to the Public Service Commission and get a CPCN. And then everything else, two megawatts or less, are minor projects. And these would be things that would it could include community solar projects um, or accessory projects that are um, accessories to maybe an existing commercial or similar use. Um, this proposal of regulations does not rec regulate you know, the small residential accessory projects that folks might want to put, you know, panels on their roof or if, you know, in their lawn or wherever they would um, work. So we're not really entering into that um, level of solar development. That That's not something we're mostly concerned about. Um, the only way that we would regulate a typical homeowner is if they're waterfront and they're on a very small grandfathered lot. So an existing develop a lot prior to the adoption of the regulations and they don't really have any place to go. And then we do allow some provisions if they have to accommodate those um, panels in the buffer. Um, so that's the only way that they would be affected. But again, the main focus was to provide a path um, for large CPCN scale projects in the resource conservation area specifically, which could be authorized by the PSC. Um, can you scroll up a little bit on the slide? At least I can't see them. Okay, thank you. Um, so for both major and minor projects in limited development areas and resource conservation areas, there is a cap of 20% if, um, I'm sorry, there's a planting requirement if of 20% if there's no existing forest on the, on the site. And if there is forest and there has to be clearing, we're capping it at 20% in limited development areas and we're capping it at 10 acres or 20% whichever is less in resource conservation areas. And Nick's gonna to talk to you about that in a minute. And then zooming in even further um, on the resource conservation area for large projects, the two things that we're trying to um, require that will treat the balance that I talked about are requiring what we call a reservation of development rights that are associated with that land. So if there's rights that are sitting there, they would be put on hold for the life of the project. And when the project is decommissioned, those rights would be afforded back to the property owner. And then we're asking that clearing be restricted within 300 feet of tidal waters or tidal wetlands where there's an existing riparian forested area so that we don't have clearing in that riparian area for new solar panels. It has to be beyond that area. If there is no forest there, they would just have to um, abide by our minimum 100 foot buffer. So at this point, I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Nick Kelly, because he's going to explain to you how we came up with our forest clearing, or he's at least going to show you how the regulations will work with regard to different size parcels. Thank you, Lisa. Um, if we can move to the next slide. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Nick Kelly. I am a regional program chief with the commission, uh, one of two chiefs along with uh, Charlotte Sheeran, who you will hear from a little bit later in this presentation. And as uh, Lisa was discussing, one of the areas that we wanted to focus on with this group was about the clearing limits because when we reached out to the um, our stakeholders, there was some questions about the clearing limits. Um, and as a result of those conversations and our own sort of internal discussions, we came up with, with the following clearing limits, and this is a table that describes it. And so in the limited development area portions of the critical area, clearing related with solar energy generating facilities is limited to 20%. And if you take a look at this table, on the left-hand side, the left-hand column, you see parcel acreage, and you see 5, 10, 20, 50, 100, 200. In your mind, when you're thinking about this, let's just assume that those parcels are fully forested. So in that first one, if it was a fully forested five acre parcel, with that 20% clearing limit, you could clear one acre. If it was a 10 acre parcel, it'd be two, all the way up to the 200 acres if that was full, fully forested, you could clear up to 40. It's a 20% limit that's very similar. It's, in fact, it's exactly the same requirement that you would have for a typical development in the critical area, like a residential subdivision they can clear up to 20% and replace it one-to-one. -one. So this matches that um, type of standard that's already in our regulations. You look on the right-hand side and sort of the last two columns, the two columns on the right, in that resource conservation area, once again, the area that's much more protected, um, your agricultural lands, your farmlands, your wetlands, those things at least described a little bit earlier, the requirements are a little bit different. 
once again, thinking of this as a fully forested parcel, where there's parcels under 50 acres, they're still going to be limited to about 20%. That's how it works out with the map. And even once you hit 50 acres, it goes to 20%. But then for any of these larger scale types of solar energy generating systems, that limit's going to be capped at 10 acres. And so this was a measure to put in to sort of, you know, balance the, the needs of, of providing alternative energy to the state while also protecting the resources that can be found in the RCA. And so as a result, we put that 10 acre cap. So if we had any very you know, big, large scale types of solar energy generating systems in the critical area, you would have this 10 acre clearing. And so that type of clearing limit, along with some of the protections of habitat protection areas, such as the fact that there's a prohibition on clearing forest interior dwelling bird habitat, provides a lot of protections um, to the critical area while still accommodating uh, solar energy generating systems in the right, in the right sections. Um, so with that, if you can move to the next slide, please. And so a second piece of this sort of in, in, um, in coordination with talking about siting of solar energy in the critical area, um, there were a lot of questions internally for sure. And then even with some of our stakeholders about a sort of, you know, well, if, if, you know, solar is allowed without growth allocation, if solar is allowed under this regulatory process, can you get an idea of how much you would expect to see in the critical area? And so we, we tried to come out with sort of what we thought could be the, you know, I don't want to call it the worst case scenario, but the full fledged scenario that might happen if, if development was to occur. And to give you some background, just to kind of give you a reminder, the critical area, the total acreage in the critical area is about 11% of the entire state. And within that critical area, the RCA is 80% of total critical area acreage, which is about 696,800 acres. In terms of siting solar energy generating facilities, particularly the larger ones, the, the large scale that go to the Public Service Commission, um, in conversations that we had with the power plant research program at DNR, you know, it was our understanding that most of these types of facilities are going to be found within a one mile corridor um, for connecting to the, to the grid, that there's this corridor that you need to be connected to sort of the energy grid in order for it to be profitable. And we talked to an economist that works for PPRP and we went through these details and we talked to some of their other staff and they said that most of these sites fall within this one mile corridor. So we asked PPRP if they could sort of give us a map to give us an idea of what was going on. And so they used their smart DG plus tool and they actually mapped these corridors onto the critical area in the RCA and they mapped it two ways. One was that they just put it on the RCA and actually put the entire critical area, but for the RCA, they put it, they laid it over the RCA map. And when you put that corridor in, it restricted that RCA acreage now down to 18.7% of the total RCA or about 130,000 acres. The other great thing was, is that they could actually start to put in some of the provisions that we had in our regulations, such as our provisions on protecting habitat protection areas like forest interior dwelling bird habitat, such as protecting of the buffer, some of these other types of clearing restrictions. And when they layered that in on top of the corridor, it actually reduced the potential acreage in the critical area that's available for solar energy to about 7.9% or 54,942 acres. So along with you know, our restrictions, our requirements and our regulations, in addition to the, the basic economic models and the basic models that a typical solar developer is going to use to determine where siting location would be in this one mile corridor, you're resulting in a very small amount of RCA acreage that's potentially available out there for development. If you can just move to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and so I wanted to also sort of give you a visual of this and I apologize that this is a little bit, um, little bit blurry. Um, this was the best we could do with the PDF, but um, as mentioned earlier um, by Kate, you do have these pamphlets in your file. So you do have these attachments and lists, this in the chart that I spoke about earlier. Um, but you can see on the left-hand side, this was the first map that PPRP put together. And it detailed, you know, sort of all the areas in the critical area that potentially were within that one mile corridor for development of solar energy generating facilities. You can see that there's sort of like these purple dots all over on the left-hand side. 
But then if you go to the right hand side, that takes into account the restrictions and the protections that we put into our regulations. And you can see that 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 area sort of is has definitely reduced, um, particularly if you sort of focus towards the southern Maryland, you look at sort of the St. Mary's County area um, down in Charles County, you can see that on the left hand side, there's a lot more areas. But when you put in these protections, um, it limits it's, it's a little bit more. On the eastern shore, I would say if you sort of look down the Route 50 corridor between around Talbot and Caroline County, you can see on the left hand side, there's a little bit more prior to having these um, regulatory requirements in our regulations, as opposed to the right hand side where there's a little bit less. And so once again, just to sort of summarize, um, we believe that, you know, the requirements that are both within sort of siting for through um, PPRP and for developers through the PSC, and also our requirements provide a good balance of allowing solar energy while also providing protections to the critical area, particularly the resource conservation area. And so with that, um, I would like to turn this back over to Lisa, who's going to talk a little bit about planting requirements in the planting plan. Okay, if we could advance the slide, please. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. So this is the last part I'm going to kind of briefly give you an overview for. Um, it's the planting plan requirements, um, which in the regulations are required, as you can see on the screen, for um, planting under panels. Um, if there's any forest mitigation due to clearing that we just talked about a few slides ago uh, that Nick described to you, or if there's any forest planting requirements, which I spoke of earlier, which is if there is no forest on a site, there's a minimum 20% um, planting requirement. So in order to minimize the effect of the solar panels on the land uses, they're required to be elevated, um, the actual panels, and um, planted underneath. And this is so they don't have to count against the lot coverage limit. Because as you recall, in the critical area and limited development areas and resource conservation areas, there is a 15% lot coverage limit. Um, so in order to mitigate for that, as long as they plant underneath, they don't have to count the area of the panels. That Now, if there's road systems or other parts of a project, that would count towards uh, the lot coverage. So for a major solar energy project, the planting must either be pollinator habitat um, or some other type of native vegetation or if it's on an existing agricultural type use of land, um, if that farmer um, can still do some type of agricultural um, use under it, whether it's some type of planting of agricultural or grazing, um, that could still happen too. Um, the planting plan is required as part of a local project approval and uh, planting, as I said, again, is required for mitigation, um, minimum planting requirements um, or, or or um, planting under the panels. So when it is required, um, we are asking that that it, it can either be on-site or off-site planting. Um, and in either case, we ask that that planting either be directed towards an existing wildlife corridor or to an existing 300 foot riparian zone along you know, a stream or a tidal waterway or contiguous to large blocks of forest, which might contain forest interior dwelling bird habitats. Um, as I said, the developer can propose planting all of these types offsite, depending on what's happening on the site that's proposed to be in the lease agreement. Um, and one reason for all the flexibility is to help also balance the interest of, you know, the agricultural preservation of agricultural lands. We got many comments about that. Um, so we want to make sure that when these things are happening, when ag lands, that while there's planting requirements, they don't absolutely have to be at that site. They can be off-site or, or managed in another way. Um, we've also built in alternative options to these traditional mitigation strategies, such as restoring or enhancing or creating a non-tidal wetland or creating wetland migration areas, um, installing non-structural shore erosion control practices, or other practices that support climate and coastal resiliency, since that's something that's on everybody's plate these days. Um, and if we can support that type of project where we believe that that is um, something that should be considered. Um, and finally, local governments can also propose something beyond what we've put in the regs that they see a need that they can fulfill um, in their 
in their county or their municipality. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned before, um, the regulations are, are now with the ALR committee um, and we're waiting for that process to take its course before they're published. Um, and that is basically the briefing, if you will, for the renewable energy regulations. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Chairman Deegan. Actually, Lisa and Chairman Deegan, um, because this is such a thorough presentation, we wanna make, and we had agreed to questions after the, the entire presentation, but that was a lot of information. And I wanna make sure our members um, have an opportunity while fresh in their minds to ask questions. I also do wanna recognize um, since the delegate was gracious enough to introduce the senators, um, we are also joined by Delegate Brooke Learman from Baltimore City who has joined us. So with that, um, if any committee members have questions, please utilize the raise hand feature and we will, of what we've discussed already, and we will call on you. I'm, I'm more than happy to kick us off if I, if I might for whoever is, is the best person to answer this. Um, first of all, the news about Oxford um, is wonderful and very happy that they are so forward thinking. How can we encourage or work with municipalities and counties in our districts to um, set themselves up for similar federal funding opportunities to, to think about uh, resilience challenges ahead? Um, well, thank you, Senator Elfrith. I'll take that question. Um, I think just continuing to provide uh, educational assistance, training assistance, those are things that um, we do locally. We have uh, quarterly meetings with our jurisdictions where we try and share um, really what the best practices that they are employing. Um, so opportunities like that, I think are very helpful. Um, I think the town clerk, Cheryl Lewis, is, is just a wonderful um, asset to the town and would be, you know, honestly, I think she's a force to be reckoned with as well. And she takes every opportunity she can to apply for grants. Um, and so, you know, providing that sort of grant writing assistance might be another area. I know that that can take a lot of time and um, knowledge as well to, to do effective grants. Um, and she hasn't achieved every single one. I think she's certainly learned over the years about how to get those. So, you know, on our end, what we try and do is just um, amongst our staff, uh, learn as much as we can all the time, share with each other um, what we are learning and then share with our local jurisdictions um, these opportunities. So um, I don't have just specific recommendations, but I think that, that those types of um, conversations um, that are, I know are happening um, are, are useful. Um, so there's, there's my thoughts on how to so maybe support on a grant writing level or on a information or educational level. Thank you, Kate, I appreciate that. Uh, any questions from the committee on anything we've covered uh, thus far? Yeah, Senator, if, if I could follow up on your question, I wanted to ask Kate if there was any other jurisdiction that is um, in the process of adopting your coastal resilience guidelines? Um, I, I wish I could say every single one was, mm -hmm. um, but it is a work in progress. Um, it's a little bit easier with the town. You know, we are working and having conversations with the city of Annapolis. Um, and I think that will be an area of exploration for some of like buffer management in the next couple of years. Um, our planners are constantly approaching uh, local jurors, you know, I think Somerset County and the Lower Shore and Worcester County. Um, I don't think any of them have come up with specific actions just yet, but we are um, continuing to kind of highlight and participate on those. So it's a little bit slow. Um, at the same time, I think it takes a lot of, um, it just takes time to understand and see how these results can come about. And so, you know, just sharing again, the success that the town of Oxford has had um, has been useful. And probably some of our staff will, will remind me later of maybe some other um, jurisdictions that are doing certain things, but um, I don't have another, you know, grand success story, but we are continuing to have those conversations. Okay, great.
And uh, Senator, I, I, I do have a solar question, unless someone else wants to. Okay. Um, thanks for the presentation about your solar regulations. I'm very interesting. And um, I guess I wanted to ask if, um, as, as far as you can tell, were the sort of two main groups that are involved in the debate about placement of solar farms, both the solar developers and then on one side and then the, the ag and land preservation advocates on the other. Would you say that both sides were happy with the outcome of your regulations? Um, I'll, I'll, I think so. I mean, we, Lisa, feel free to jump in here. Um, but we did, we talked to the Maryland Farm Bureau. Um, Department of Ag was a part of our work group. Um, and they were satisfied with the, with the ultimate package. And then we also consulted with a number of, um, a, of companies in the renewable energy industry. And um, we never got any significant pushback on these regulations either. So my assessment would be yes. Lisa, do you agree? I do. I do agree with that based on, you know, our conversations, um, particularly with CBF. And, um, you know, they had concerns about whether this was, you know, expanding into the critical area. But our view is, given the Public Service Commission's preemption authority, and I believe CBF well, I shouldn't put words in their mouth, but I believe that they generally understand is that, um, you know, these things could potentially pop up in the critical area and or the resource conservation area specifically. And um, it's probably best to have some extra protections to balance, you know, what potentially could happen um, in the future. Delegate, if I could just, if I could just add one thing, Delegate, uh, that's why I asked them to add that uh, slide for our stakeholders, because they have the staff is to put a tremendous amount of time into talking to all those people and making sure we had a good consensus on the program. So I feel happy about it. I think Kate does, and obviously everybody at the commission does. But it took a tremendous amount of time and effort. Okay. Thank you. Well, I, I appreciate that, particularly because I represent the Alliance for um, Herring Bay. So I appreciate you <laughs> you uh, engaging as many stakeholders as, as uh, reached out. Thank you for that. Not seeing any other questions from the committee. Um, I think we're, we're ready to move on. Thank you. So we'll move on to uh, Emily, um, right? And talk about enforcement. Legal, legal landscape there? Yes, correct. Thank you, Charlie. Um, if we could move to the next slide, please. My name is Emily Vineri. I'm an Assistant Attorney General for the Critical Area Commission. And one of the questions that the um, committee asked of the commission was to address some enforcement issues. So I'm here to provide some of the legal background on that. Um, and then you'll hear from one more member of the Critical Area Commission staff who will talk um, later about what's happening on the staff level. Um, and I have to always start with the 2008 legislative amendments when I talk about enforcement, um, because those amendments, it was chapter 119 of the 2008 Laws of Maryland, and that really strengthened the enforcement and variance provisions in a number of ways. And I'm not gonna go through all of those ways, but I would like to highlight just a few. Um, first, it provided authority to the Maryland Home Improvement Commission, the Home Builders Registration Unit, and to the Department of Natural Resources to impose certain sanctions for tree cutting and tree clearing in the critical area. Um, it also established certain factors that a local jurisdiction must take into account when determining how much penalty to be assessed. And those criteria had to include the cost of restoration and mitigation. And that was a new requirement in 2008. Um, it required local programs to include specific administrative enforcement provisions. And again, that was brand new back in 2008. It provided um, the right of entry authority to local authorities to identify or verify suspected violations and to stop development activities or to issue citations. And then finally, one of the biggest and one of the one that has had the most significant effect was that it tightened up after the fact variance provisions. Um, so before 2008, a person could apply 
for an after the fact variance to legalize an unpermitted activity in the critical area. Um, and then after the 2008 amendments, that local jurisdiction was actually required to cite the illegal activity as a violation first and had to address it as a violation first um, before any future uh, variances could be applied for or obtained. So to give you an example of this, if somebody um, decided to build a house in the critical area buffer, which is that first 100 feet closest to the water, and they decided to do that without any um, permits or any uh, any authority whatsoever uh, before 2008, that individual property owner could have applied for a variance in order to legalize what was an, other, uh, an otherwise unauthorized activity in the buffer. Um, but after 2008, that's not the case anymore. There is an after the fact variance provision process that has that is laid out in the law and that has to be followed by local jurisdictions. Um, so that's a really important component of our overall legal um, legal landscape in terms of the 2008 amendments. Um, so bringing us up to today, obviously it's 12 years later, um, and it's just important to remember that all of these 2008 amendments were against the backdrop of what already existed in in the critical area law. So importantly, you've heard from everybody so far has mentioned this, that the critical area programs are actually implemented at the local level and they're enforced at the local level. So that means that local jurisdictions have the first opportunity and the ability to enforce their specific tailored uh, critical area program. They do that first before the state provides any assistance. Um, if local jurisdictions, for whatever reason, are unable to enforce the law on their own, they may request assistance from the Critical Area Commission, or they may request that the chairman refer an enforcement action to the Office of the Attorney General. And these are the same provisions for regular critical area violations as they are for tree cutting and tree clearing violations in the critical area. Um, uh, additionally, if a critical area commission, if the critical area commission believes that a local jurisdiction has failed to enforce its provisions and failed to enforce its own program, then the commission notifies that local jurisdiction and that local jurisdiction then has 30 days to correct the problem. And if they fail to correct the problem, then the uh, chairman may refer that action to the attorney general. Dealing with regular critical area violations of the enforcement tools is that the chairman has the authority to intervene in any administrative, judicial, or appeal area. And then on the last, um, the last bullet there, Office of the Attorney General Outreach, what I've tried to do in my job as an Assistant Attorney General for the Critical Area Commission is to establish positive working relationships with as many of the county attorneys as I can, and in addition, as many attorneys to boards of appeals, because we want them to be able to reach out to us and ask questions and feel comfortable doing that, knowing that we can assist when asked. Um, secondly, I've provided educational presentations to boards of appeals and to critical, local critical area staff on these after the fact variance procedures just to ensure that they are um, understood and being followed. Um, we also prepare referrals to the Environmental Crimes Unit of the Office of the Attorney General. And then finally, and most importantly, um, when asked, we assist. So for me, this can take a number of different forms. This might be informally talking with a county attorney through an enforcement strategy or a specific case or specific evidence um, or a specific witness. Uh, or this might mean taking on a case completely at the state level when a county does refer it to the chairman or to, um, and when the chairman refers it to the attorney general. So that's the end of my piece of the presentation. I would like to turn it over to Charlotte Sheeran to talk about the staff level enforcement process. Thank you, Emily. Um, if you could go to the next slide. Um, so as Emily said, my name is Charlotte Sheeran and I am one of the regional program chiefs with Nick Kelly. Um, as Emily discussed, given that the law, uh, the critical area law is implemented locally and also enforced locally, our focus as commission staff is really to help our local jurisdictions improve their enforcement efforts. 
Um, and so we do this by offering technical assistance as well as educational opportunities. The seven natural resource planners in our office coordinate directly with local critical area staff at each of the local jurisdictions. Um, and they are available to answer questions and provide guidance to the local staff. So just as an example, we recently coordinated with and advised Talbot County on how to handle a buffer clearing violation that arose. Um, we also serve as a conduit to report violations from um, the public, from local citizens. Um, and we also can make inquiries as to the status of enforcement cases. Uh, with the pandemic, we have been able to continue um, providing that conduit from local citizens to local jurisdictions by keeping our office staff uh, to answer phone calls and direct citizens who might call in to report a violation as needed. We have also, we also provide uh, comment letters and we testify at Board of Appeals when violations have been appealed and we support counties when cases are appealed um, further above the Board of Appeals. Since the pandemic, we have actually testified before the Talbot County and Cecil County Board of Appeals virtually and before the Dorchester County Board of Appeals in person. Um, lastly, local jurisdictions are required to update their critical area programs every six years. So our staff has actually developed a model ordinance which contains several provisions related to enforcement. And then we review those provisions with our local jurisdictions during the comprehensive review process to make sure that their local critical area programs include the necessary enforcement uh, provisions. And we also uh, have in the past and will continue to do educational programming for um, several different critical area topics, including enforcement, whether that uh, educational program might be in person or online given our um, current pandemic status. So with that, I will turn it over to uh, Kate Charbonneau. Thank you, Charlotte, and thank you, Emily. Um, just to conclude this portion of our, our presentation, um, I just wanna reiterate you know, the broad set of changes that have been made by the General Assembly over the years um, to provide an, an effective set of enforcement tools um, are, are available in there for local governments to use. Um, in my view, one of the most effective tools um, has been the after the fact violation provisions. Um, you know, as Emily mentioned, prior to those changes, you know, we did see um, major violations where unfortunately it was, um, you know, asked for forgiveness as opposed to permission. Um, but, you know, now the situation is significantly different. Um, you know, if there is a structure in the buffer built without permits, um, that applicant has to consider, you know, one, there's a requirement of payment of fines as well as mitigation. Um, if they do decide to seek a variance, they are waiving their right to appeal um, the enforcement violation, you know, the enforcement action. And then there's additional mitigation that would be required um, should a variance uh, be granted were they to meet all of the variance standards. So it's really changed the landscape in many ways. Um, and what we found is that counties who are using all of these tools successfully are seeing compliance. Um, and so we've been trying to just up our educational and technical assistance efforts and build those relationships, um, as Emily has mentioned, so that you know our county attorneys, our county staff understand what tools are at their disposal and how to use them best to um, to you know get to compliance. So um, with that, we look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Kate and team. Uh, Senator Simon Eyre, please. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, you said at the very end that you're seeing compliance. So I imagine in the first couple of years, it took a while to, to get up and running. How much better is it now? I mean, you're seeing reduced enforcement cases. Um, can you just go in a little more detail with that? Um, I haven't counted the cases, um, but in talking with our jurisdictions, for example, Baltimore County, 
um, would tell you that, you know, when they do have a violation, they spend a lot of time talking with um, that individual. Sometimes, you know, oftentimes it, it is mistakes, um, but they are, you know, once they sort of are able to use those tools and walk that individual through the process, um, as sites getting restored, structures are being moved out, you know, for a lot of violations tend to be, you know, sheds in the buffer or smaller, smaller actions. Um, and so, you know, when I talk to counties that are using all of those tools, um, I wouldn't say necessarily that they've seen suddenly fewer violations, although we have not seen the major violations of, you know, 20 years ago, um, but they, they are finding it to be effective. Um, we are still obviously, you know, having to communicate with some of our other jurisdictions. You know, occasionally we still get variance applications for a violation where the enforcement process hasn't been followed. And so we have to go back to that jurisdiction and remind them again of all of the steps that need to be followed. Um, and often when we do that, rather than, you know, someone proceeding with a, a variance application, they honestly just remove the violation. Um, and so we do see that it's effective in that way as well. So are you saying you're seeing a reduction in violations or you're seeing it's effective once they have the violation? And to follow up that question, mm -hmm. I would think there is more education and people realize you're enforcing this, that would help reduce the number of violations. I'm just wondering if you're seeing that from the section. Um, I would need to go back and talk to, I think, our, our local critical area planners and ask that specific question if they think that that is happening, if they think they are seeing a reduction. I, I do recall having some conversations with like Talbot County Code, en Code Enforcement, um, and they've been working to build relationships with their um, tree contractors. And so, so they do believe that they are seeing fewer violations with those tree contractors. Um, and so I think, you know, where you have, you know, contractors or others who, you know, have that sort of connection to knowledge, um, yeah, vi fewer violations are, are occurring as a result of that. Um, okay. Unfortunately, we do still have unlicensed contractors doing work. Right. I appreciate the work you're doing. If you could provide me with any of that information, that'd be great. And I know we have 20 more slides, so I won't ask you to respond to this, but if you could just let me know, like, what are the, like, top three violations that we're seeing um, off the line? But thank you. Absolutely. Sure thing. Thank you, Senator Simonair. Uh, those are wonderful questions, and we look forward to uh, the commission giving us some follow-up, particularly because you've made such an investment in technical assistance, and so we'd like to see the result of that. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other raised hands on the Senate or the House side. Mr. Chair, if you have any thoughts. No, I, I don't have any further questions myself. Um, so I guess at this point we can uh, move on to the next stage in our briefing, which is to hear from our friends at the Chesapeake Bay Commission, um, who will be talking about similar efforts on these types of issues in Virginia and Pennsylvania. So I'd like to uh, turn things over to Mark Hoffman, who's the Maryland director for the commission. Thank you, Delegate Stein and uh, co-chair um, Senator Alfred as well. It's glad to be here today. If I could uh, have the next um, slide, please. There we go. Um, the um, is that the, the bottom of it's not showing. At least I don't. I can't see the bottom of it, but that's okay. Um, I'm here today. First of all, for the record, my name is Mark Hoffman. I'm the Maryland director of the uh, Chesapeake Bay Commission. Uh, with me today is uh, Morel King, our Pennsylvania director, and Adrian Kutula, our Virginia director. They'll be available if you all have some more detailed questions about the. Uh, rules in those jurisdictions, um, they would be the subject matter experts uh, who would be able to, you know, help you dive a little deeper. Um, today, I'm going to just talk about uh, three things. First, just very briefly about the commission, uh, who I am, the organization I represent. Uh, secondly, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Bay program and the Bay restoration efforts. A number of the members of the Joint Committee 
uh, are, don't serve on uh, any of the General Assembly's environment uh, focused committees. So, so just to make sure everyone's sort of coming at things from the same um, perspective. And then thirdly, I'll get to the meat of the discussion, which will be the programs that are, are somewhat, which we've identified as being somewhat analogous to the uh, critical area program in the state of Maryland. So if we could have the next slide, please. The uh, commission is a tri-state uh, uh, legislative commission. We are a, a creature of state law in Maryland, Virginia, and Pennsylvania. Uh, we have 21 members, 15 of which are state legislators. Uh, I'd be quick to point out uh, Senator Gazone is the current chair of the Maryland delegation, but we're very grateful to have uh, Senator Elfrith is the other Senate member of the uh, Maryland delegation. Delgut Stein is the uh, vice chair of the Maryland de delegation. Additionally, delegates Love and Brid Bridges uh, make up the rest of the uh, Maryland legislative component. Um, um, DNR Secretary um, Hadaway Riccio is the uh, administrative member and uh, former Senator uh, Mac Middleton uh, is the citizen member of the uh, delegation. The goal of the commission is to help uh, our legislative members uh, work to translate science into, into coordinated policy to restore uh, the nation's greatest uh, estuary. Um, and we work across the watershed with the Bay Program. We're a signatory, uh, the commission's a signatory of the Bay Agreements and to help uh, get the right policy uh, in place to uh, restore the Bay. We also are very active on the federal side. Uh, we have a, actually a federal lobbyist and uh, work very hard to uh, ensure funding uh, for the Bay programs and everything else that are, is needed to make uh, restoration possible. Next. The um, part of why I'm here today, obviously, is when you look at the Bay Watershed, you can see to the extent to which both uh, Pennsylvania and Virginia uh, constitute incredibly large geographic scale of the of the uh, watershed, bigger than than the amount of land in Maryland that's in the Bay Watershed. The watershed is some 64,000 square miles. Um, it has 150 uh, major rivers and many local governments. We work, that's one of the main challenges, uh, not unlike those faced by the Critical Area Commission in working to coordinate with a, a variety of local governments, counties, municipalities, boroughs, which even becomes more complex uh, once you uh, step outside the boundaries of, the, um, of our, our state. Next. Um, I might be saying the obvious here, but I think it's important. Uh, the reason we're here is because the Chesapeake Bay is, is considered impaired. It's an impaired waterway. And this is a great, I love this illustration there on the left. This is something back from one of the most oldest historical uh, depictions of, of life of, of Native Americans on the bay. And, and the one thing you, is extremely noticeable is the clarity of the water. Back when our populations were much uh, smaller, our shorelines were much more forested, our, our uh, cities were much uh, smaller. The water clarity really helped define uh, the, the bay and also the uh, species of fish like there, there's a sturgeon there in the foreground, a species which is now extremely rare in the watershed. Today, unfortunately, uh, many of the rivers and streams in the bay are impaired. They have too much uh, nitrogen, phosphorus and sediment, which creates algae blooms which uh, starves the water from oxygen and without oxygen, life cannot um, blossom. Next. And it's a diverse uh, issue. We have uh, um, the pollution sources come from, from agriculture, 41% of uh, wastewater, 21%, et cetera. Stormwater, septics, uh, and even natural. There's a lot of nitrogen. Uh, there's less than there used to be thanks to federal uh, clean air uh, standards, but there's a lot of nitrogen still falls from the air and ultimately, ultimately makes its way into our waterways. So it's, uh, it's, uh, there's no one culprit, there's no, no, you know, no, no bad guy, it's, it's a big problem uh, with uh, diverse uh, sources and it requires diverse approaches. Next, please. The uh, 
a lot of you have heard about the uh, TMDL. This is the total, total maximum daily load. This is the current plan all the jurisdictions are working on to achieve the goals of the TMDL by 2025. There's an allocation to each jurisdiction in terms of how much uh, the pollutant loads need to be reduced. And once we get to the, uh, and there's great science, we have tremendous, the Bay is one of the best studied uh, water bodies in the world. Uh, and once we get to the, uh, the nutrient loads of the TMDL, the water will have enough uh, oxygen to support uh, aquatic life uh, in all, all forms. That, so it's all science driven in terms of these levels and how much we need to do things, et cetera, et cetera. Next, please. And just finally, before I get into the details of the particular state programs, uh, the Bay program is, um, is, includes all of the jurisdictions in the, uh, that have land within the watershed, uh, the states uh, and the District of Columbia. Uh, additionally, the uh, federal government is a key partner. Uh, the EPA is the lead agency uh, within the federal government uh, on the Bay program, but uh, many USDA, Interior, uh, et cetera, uh, Department of Defense are all vitally important uh, federal partners uh, in this work. And additionally, the commission is of course, one of the uh, members of the Bay program as well. Okay, now I'm gonna talk um, about uh, the similar programs. If I could have the next slide, please in uh, our neighboring jurisdictions. So let me start with the Virginia, because this is probably the most analogous situation. Virginia, as we know, has as many miles of, of tidewater. Um, is, um, so so the, they have uh, many of the same concerns that you had when you passed the uh, critical area law back in the late 1980s. And in 1988, about the same time that the critical area law was passed, the uh, a Commonwealth uh, enacted what is called the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Act, or, or more commonly referred to as the Bay Act. And the whole goal of the Bay Act was to improve uh, water quality uh, within, uh, within the Bay, within the state of Virginia, by requiring the effective land management and sound land use planning. And that's the only program in the state that comprehensively addresses land use planning and uh, its impacts on water quality. And very similar uh, to the critical area program, really it's a local government based initiative where the uh, state government works to assist local governments with land use planning to meet water quality goals and the development of land use ordinances and comprehensive plans. So in that way, it's a very analogous in, in that it's not a centralized command and control structure, but, but very similar to the critical area law. Um, there, there are guidelines at the state level, but the actual implementation and is done at a more local level where that local uh, expertise and input and citizen involvement uh, is, is, is close to, much closer to home. Next, please. So um, somewhat like the critical area commission there in Virginia, there is a state water control board. And the, one of the, uh, one in, in their suite of responsibilities are, are, are promulgating regular, like we've heard about already today, promulgating and keeping regulations to program implementation current, uh, ensuring that local governments and their zoning plans and ordinances are in compliance with the uh, Bay Act regulations and they provide, just as the Critical Area Commission, they provide technical and financial assistance to Tidewater local governments. So I'm gonna mention this on my next slide, but one thing that's very important in Virginia, the Bay Act only does only apply to the tide, quote unquote, Tidewater jurisdiction. So it doesn't apply uh, statewide. It is only when there's actually uh, a jurisdiction that's influenced by tidal order. We do need to make that, uh, make that clear. The Bay Act and the Bay Act staff also assist on other uh, watershed perspectives, such as the Chesapeake Bay uh, program, the development of the uh, watershed implementation plans or the WIPs that we you all heard so much about recently and other committees of the Bay program. Next, please. 
So as I said, the uh, Act's provisions only apply to tidewater locales, and it requires the um, these local governments to adopt ordinances to define two categories of land use. One are resource protection areas, such as perennial streams, uh, tidal uh, and connected and contiguous non-tidal wetlands, and 100-foot buffers uh, from those features, all terms that are familiar to you uh, from the perspective of the Maryland's critical area law. And they also define resource management areas such as steep slo slopes, erodible soils, et cetera. And then so certain zoning regulations and ordinances have to be adopted to uh, protect uh, these types of areas. And then these plans are re reviewed by the Department of Environmental Quality uh, to ensure uh, compliance with the uh, provisions of the Bay Act. So then just briefly, um, one other, uh, next slide please. Um, one other thing I just wanted to mention this, I know there's a lot of in interest uh, across the jurisdictions, particularly in the mid, mid Atlantic, given that we, uh, unfortunately, um, you know, we are uh, collectively uh, one of the most sort of ground zero for sea level rise due to climate change. And uh, just like Maryland's had the, is working and being trying to be proactive related to these events, uh, so is the state of Virginia. Uh, they, uh, the governor uh, and tw the, uh, Governor Northam in 2018 issued a new executive order to develop uh, Virginia's first uh, coastal resilience master plan. And the plan provides a pathway for increased uh, coastal uh, resistance and, and directs the development of a coastal resilience master plan uh, addressing uh, climate change, flooding, uh, et cetera. And just recently, um, they've released the uh, framework document, which sort of for this plan, which lays out how it's going to proceed, sort of the key objectives and the approach they're going to take towards uh, coastal adaptation. Next, please. Now, um, now I'm going to turn to Pennsylvania. Obviously, things it's a little different. Uh, there is there is no tide water uh, in in Pennsylvania. So the, uh, the, the, the rules I'm gonna talk about and trying to looking for, for sort of equivalency uh, programs uh, similar to that or the, to the critical area law, um, the one that really stands out are the riparian buffer equivalency and offsetting uh, laws. These, the, these are uh, statutes enacted by Pennsylvania's uh, General Assembly with enacting regulations by their Department of Environmental Protection they require a 150 foot setback from uh, high quality or exceptional value waters for any disturbance activities, unless there's an exception. And if the waters are attaining a designated use, then the, 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 um, it's, got the, it's important to protect the riparian, the existing riparian forest buffer. But if the uh, area is not attaining designated use. And that means if it's an impaired waterway, if there are if there are problems in the water, then it's required that the applicant uh, establish a riparian forest buffer. And we well know that riparian forest buffers are one of the most cost-effective and, and functionally effective means for uh, reducing uh, pollutant load, loading to our creeks and uh, streams. Next, please. There's also uh, was an amendment to this provision in 2014, which gave a little more flexibility to the agency. Uh, it allows instead of um, a riparian forest buffer per se, if there are alternative uh, approaches or management strategies that it can achieve the same effectiveness of a riparian area, then they're allowable. And it also allows that for offsets uh, or replacement buffers in the same drainage that can be as, that have to be as close as possible to the site. These are in, in situations where there, for, for whatever reason, it's just simply not possible to to make create the buffer on site. Then the applicant is required to create it uh, in a similar buffer buffer nearby. Next, please. So just to uh, kind of wrap things up. Um, I think it's important um, to, to always take note that uh, the water quality trends uh, are improving for, for all of the key pollutants, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediments. So we're, uh, we're there's a lot to do 
uh, we're, we're reminded of that daily, uh, but at the same time, um, the, the effort, the collective effort that all the jurisdictions, uh, you know, to a large extent led by the Maryland General Assembly have made over the past uh, 30 plus years uh, are paying dividends and, and we continue to make uh, progress, albeit perhaps slower than uh, we all collectively might want. We do continue to make progress. And the final um, one more to go. And that's, uh, that's it, I'll be happy. And Adrian and Morel are here. Um, um, and Anne could not make it today. She certainly says hello to, she knows uh, most of you, all of you, I'm sure. Uh, but we're always here to help uh, our role of the commission, the staff is to help you all as members of the legislature uh, translate uh, science into sound public policy. So feel free to call on us whenever uh, you, you have the need. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Delegate Stein and Senator Alford. Thank you, Mark, for that excellent presentation and uh, overview as to what uh, Virginia and Pennsylvania are doing with respect to, um, I guess, sort of their analogs to the, the critical area in Maryland. Um, one question I have is, has there been any, I mean, I, I know uh, that the commission is very good at sharing best practices among the three states. And, you know, sometimes legislation gets introduced in Maryland because, you know, the Virginia delegation presents on a good bill on, on a particular topic and vice versa. Um, is there anything particular that relates to uh, the critical area where, um, you know, there's been a good exchange of information and where, um, you know, one or more states of the commission have said, aha, we really need to implement that practice. Um, well, generally, I mean, there, there are many examples uh, over the years where, I mean, like fertilizer usage is a good one. I mean, they, not specific to critical areas, well, where mm -hmm. an idea has sort of been seeded by one jurisdiction and then, you know, and brought together. I mean, you all passed the bill on a P, uh, firefighting film last year. That was after mm -hmm. kind of hearing about it at a, at a um, uh, what Virginia had done the year before. Uh, specific to the critical area, I think the, um, I mean, both Maryland and in, in Virginia, it's clear from, from what I've said and in, from the briefings given by the uh, uh, critical area staff, <laughs> executive director, that uh, early on, uh, both the Commonwealth and Maryland realized the significance of the of that area, you know, immediately adjacent to the state's waterways. And 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 if we were going to be serious about protecting uh, the the bay and in, in, in making the bay better, we're going to have to sort of start there, kind of at ground zero. So so I think you, but both general assemblies took very bold action back in the, you know, the late 1980s, clearly with a lot, it took a lot of political capital to, you know, to make those changes. And it's been, and, and it hasn't been certainly without growing pains, but, um, um, but it's part of the, the suite of tools that are helping deliver better water quality. I'm not, I hope that, I don't know if that answers your yes. question. Yes, yes, it does. And actually I do have a- I could add a little bit, I oh, guess. Sure. Um, as far as the Virginia perspective, um, during our most recent General Assembly session, the, the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Act language was actually amended slightly to, um, to account for coastal resilience. So they're actually in the process right now of amending the regulations um, to take into to take it into account. And I think that's gonna be a very groundbreaking effort, certainly for the Commonwealth. Um, I was actually on a call last week where they're starting to look into what the data sources are gonna be for the information moving forward. So I think that's certainly an opportunity for you know all of the various entities working on this to collaborate and move forward maybe at once. And I don't know if that's something that exists um, in the critical areas language in code right now. I saw in the presentation, there's guidance for it. So that's certainly an opportunity. And we're gonna have a presentation um, 
at our January meeting on uh, the Coastal Resilience Framework as well that Virginia has been working on. So hopefully that's an area that all of us can kind of move forward into together. Okay, great. And, and actually, if I could follow up with a, uh, a Virginia question, um, has there been interest or concern in Virginia about doing the type of regulation of solar farms in, I guess, the, the tidewater areas that, um, that the Maryland's you know, Critical Area Commission has, has done? I wouldn't say that it's been specific to the Bay Act. Uh, there certainly is a lot of concern um, on the solar farm front, just at the locality level. Um, mm -hmm. I from a couple of my delegation members, but not specifically in regards to the Bay Act and how it interplays in that way. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard it more in relation to our stormwater regulations. Um, you know, is it pervious? Is it impervious? Um, those types of questions. But it's certainly okay. an issue down here. Great. I think I saw that Senator Simon Air has a question. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's nice to see you again, Mark. Uh, I know you come before our committee quite often. Um, I, I was going to ask you two questions. One, you I think you answered in your opening statement. I, I always say this when we get together um, that I don't think this is a partisan issue, but I know that Maryland has only one party represented on your commission. I believe all five members are from one party. Um, and I think you confirmed that in your opening statement. If I'm wrong, let me know. Um, but the other question is, we, we have bills come before us quite often. Um, last several years, it was um, a senator put in, quit polluting my Bay Act. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Uh, but it was basically saying some states north of us were not doing their part in cleaning up the Bay. Um, can you just give us a, your sense of that? Um, if that's true, are they very far behind us, um, which also affects our state? Sure. Yeah, it's good to see you, Senator. And um, you are correct. Just that is a matter of fact that the uh, the membership is uh, of of one party, but they are um, they are they are appointed by the presiding officers of each chamber, as we've you know as you know. So as far as the um, yeah, I'm very familiar with the the, the some of the prior legislative, which um, I'll be qu you know quite an honest seemed more theatrical than su substantive um, because the key to working with uh, our part, this is a cooperative venture. And it's certainly true that Maryland uh, has done more and, and put more resources and achieved greater results in terms of Bay restoration. And to a large extent, uh, it's because Maryland has the most uh, to uh, to win or lose in terms of bay restoration, we are sort of ground zero for the Chesapeake, and and you all have done an amazing job in in through things like the Bay Restoration Fund, et cetera. You, the the progress the state's made has been remarkable. That said, uh, the perspective is not the same uh, uh, in uh, in Williamsport or in Scranton. Or, or farther up in the Pennsylvania. And I'll let uh, Morel King, and I'll turn this over to Morel King. She can answer directly as a lifelong Pennsylvanian, our Pennsylvania rep. But we are working very hard. Our members, our legislative members in Pennsylvania are very dedicated to, to working to achieve the resources and the improvements needed. But, but there's no question that there is not, uh, that there's a long way to go and and the focus north of the mason dixon line is is more about it's it's it, not that it's not true here as well but it's about local water quality it's about what actions need to be done at a local level to improve local water quality it's not about uh improving the main stem of the chesapeake bay or about oysters or striped bass it's about uh, brook trout and about hellbenders and about the, the, the aquatic organisms that, that thrive in clean, vibrant, uh, cold water. So um, your point's well taken, uh, but, but the spirit of the commission and, and from our perspective is that, that cooperation and joint effort and collaboration are gonna give us yield, yield, yield better results than confrontation. I mean, as we all know, there's currently litigation uh, uh, by both the um, 
Maryland uh, is, is currently in, in uh, federal court uh, with the EPA. Uh, there are uh, very prominent uh, st state and environmental organizations in, in, the, in there as well. So, and we'll see how that plays out. There's some, some legal questions about the legal enforceability of the TMDL. Uh, that's really something for the lawyers and the, you know, the courts to figure out. But, um, but we, you know, th there's certainly truth uh, that we need to do more, more. And we've worked very hard to get additional federal resources, uh, particularly for agriculture, because part of the issue is that the nature of the pollution is, is very different. Maryland, the big thing that's allowed Maryland to be successful is the fact that we had some uh, large wastewater treatment plants with through the BRF, we've spent over a billion dollars upgrading our wastewater treatment plants and, and the resultant nutrient reductions have been very large. In Pennsylvania, that's not the case. They don't have these large point sources. It's all non-point, it's mostly ag. And ag is very difficult to deal with. It's difficult to deal with in Maryland. And uh, so so it's a challenge, but uh, your point's well taken, sir. And, I, and we, it, we gotta continue to press on it. Well, Mark, I don't know if you guys came and testified, but you know, if they continue to put that legislation in, I'd appreciate you at least putting some written testimony in. And you know, when you have a bill that says let's protect our bay, it's really hard to vote against unless we have some good counter arguments. I appreciate that. Thank you, Senator. And if I'm Morrell, if if you if you would want to maybe jump in and, and briefly talk about your perspective as the uh, on this from a Pennsylvania perspective. Hi, sure, thank you. I don't really have too much to add, Mark. You did a great job. Um, yeah, just just to reiterate that in Pennsylvania, the Chesapeake Bay watershed is just one of six major uh, drainage basins. Uh, we have Great Lakes, Ohio, Mississippi, Delaware. Um, so it's, we need statewide solutions in Pennsylvania, and that's what drives our policy up here, um, not necessarily anything specifically for the Bay, although our, our Bay Commission members in particular have been leaders in carrying statewide legislation like our REAP tax credits for Ag BMPs, like the Growing Greener program, um, like the agricultural cost share bill that um, is out there now pending. So we do work collaboratively um, with the other states in that regard. Um, but yeah, it's about statewide policy and uh, local water quality for the most part up here in Pennsylvania. Not that we don't care about the Bay, we absolutely do, but it's just another uh, wrinkle and challenge we have to overcome. Yeah, and one thing we had actually had a very interesting analysis done sort of comparing the um, the legislative from a legislative perspective, comparing the, the three jurisdictions. And I'll, I'll, I'll send that to you, Senator. But one thing uh, that, that, that I always, it really hadn't dawned on me before, but but it, from a state sort of uh, politics perspective, really Pennsylvania has two uh, two key spots. One is Philadelphia and the other is Pittsburgh. Well, what do Philadelphia and Pittsburgh have in common? Well, neither of them are in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So that's a kind of challenge that to echo Morrell's comment about statewide solutions. That's not, I'm not, and again, well, I'm not trying to make excuses. None of us would, but it, it's just, uh, it's just, it, it helps try to understand where we are and, and help us develop the tools to get to where we need to be. So thanks. Mark, Mark, thank you. And, and Senator Simon, this is exactly why Delegate Stein and I had wanted to have this conversation today because we, we had a wonderful discussion Geez, this time last year when the, the commission was in, in uh, Gettysburg with just this idea that we kind of come, come to this challenge of the Bay from our specific statewide perspectives, but to appreciate the nuance and the differences in our states and, and comparing not just the state legislatures, but the, but the dynamics of the different watersheds and, and the dynamics of the fact that Pennsylvania has, and Morrell can correct me, is it, is it over 1500 municipalities, Morrell? I think it's over 2,000 actually in, in Pennsylvania and in, in all of the Commonwealth, yes. Right, and, and the fact that I believe, and I 
half of your streams are considered impaired. I think just understanding yep, the nuance perfect. and the detail of the challenges that Pennsylvania faces, it helps us make better decisions and, and, and hopefully understand the challenges that they have. Uh, but the Bay Commission members from Pennsylvania are incredibly passionate about solving this issue. It's just a question of how we can best support them to convince their colleagues who represent other watersheds to do the right thing as well. But this is exactly why we wanted to have this conversation that it is a regional effort um, and we need to think regionally. Thank you, Senator. Um, and and, and I Mark- just, Senator, I just wanna say, I, I completely agree with, with what you said. And uh, you know that's part of the perspective that, um, that we're, we're gaining from being members of the commission. And, and Mark, could we could we share that presentation from from the Gettysburg meeting with this with this group? Because I think it is it's just eye opening to see the challenges our our partner Commonwealths face, and we need to think outside of the box with some of our solutions considering those challenges. Certainly, I'll get it to uh, Patrick. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Was there anyone else who had a question um, for for Mark or? Morel or Adrian from the Bay Commission. Okay, well, seeing none, thanks very much uh, again to Mark, Adrian, and Morel for your presentation. And uh, Senator, I'd like to hand things back over to you. And, and yeah, special thanks to, to Morel and Adrian for uh, the magic of Zoom coming into uh, Maryland from your Commonwealth. Thank you for taking the time today. Um, next up, uh, we have our, our good friend from the Department of Legislative Services, Andrew Gray, is going to talk to us about the Comprehensive Flood Management Program, which is a relatively new uh, pot of money. Um, it's just a few years old. We wanted to make sure this, this committee had an understanding of the program. Um, it, it's reached thus far in the need moving forward, considering the fact that just by, by the very nature of flooding, um, most of that will occur and has occurred in the critical area. So we thought it was a nice overlap. Andrew, if you wouldn't mind uh, giving us some background. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, just the comprehensive flood management programs managed by the Maryland Department of the Environment. It was originally established back in 1976 to promote the development of local flood management plans, fund studies of watersheds and support capital projects for flood control and watershed management. It's only available for county and municipal governments in terms of the grant funding. And previously it was funded through 2002. But then uh, it was a long hiatus. And it was uh, recently started up again for funding in $5 million in fiscal 2020. And then in fiscal 2021, there was $200,000 in general funds and $5.98 million in general obligation bond funding that was provided. And this is largely due to the flooding concerns in Ellicott City. In terms of some of the uses of that funding, the statutory uses for watershed studies, the Maryland Department of the Environment can use it for watershed studies or it can provide grants to subdivisions to pay for the entire cost of watershed studies. Capital projects can be funded for the sub subdivisions for flood control and watershed management capital projects and for design purchase and installation of automated flood warning projects. Uh, acquisition purposes can also be funded. MDE can provide grants to subdivisions immediately after a flood for acquisition of any flood damage owner occupied dwelling. And finally, in terms of recent work, uh, there's legislation that was passed back in 2019 session, there's chapter 651, 652 of 2019, that provided for the final category of funding which is for infrastructure damage. So MDE may award grants to subdivisions that have incurred at least a million dollars in infrastructure damage caused by a flood event that occurred on or after January 1, 2009. And that's up to 100% for fiscal 2021 and 2022, and up to 50% for fiscal 2023 and thereafter. And that funding is mandated at $3 million, at least in the state budget in fiscal 21 and 22, and at least $2 million in fiscal 23. In terms of the funding allocation in fiscal 2020, the first year of funding in recent years, it was $5 million in total. The city of Annapolis received a million dollars. Ellicott City received, or um, Howard County and Fort Ellicott City received $3.4 million. There was $600,000 received by Baltimore City for the area along Frederick Avenue between Overbrook Road and South Beachfield Avenue. And then for fiscal 21 funding, a uh, number of projects were funded. One of the larger ones was the $3 million for Ellicott City, Maryland Avenue culverts. $3 million there. And there was also funding for 
around $368,000 in Dorchester County for Cambridge seawall replacement. Uh, Annapolis City Dock stormwater and flood mitigation received $700,000 as well. So the total of um, $5.98 million in total for uh, all the projects. In terms of future funding needs for the Comprehensive Flood Management Program, certainly the legislature and the governor can discuss various possibilities for the use of that funding. In terms of a background, the Comprehensive Flood uh, Management Program does have a grant ranking criteria that provides some guidance in terms of how the administration would rank those projects that would come in for funding for fiscal 22. Um, those are based on the state's current administrative plan priorities. This is uh, the administrative plan is put together by the Maryland Emergency Management Agency, kind of tails on to the um, hazard mitigation plan for the overall state's uh, needs to address hazards in the state. The priorities are for st structural community-based risk reduction projects, acquisition, demolition of structures within identified hazardous areas, infrastructure protection, property protection measures, increasing resiliency to climate change, and finally projects that are counted toward the watershed implementation plan. In terms of some of the mapping that's going on for this, there is the flood, uh, flood maps, the RID flood risk application that you can see online actually shows the different um, areas in which there's potential for flooding in Maryland. It also kind of informs how that funding can be used. And I'd be willing to take any questions. Thank you, Andrew, for that uh, thorough overview. We appreciate it. I'm not seeing any questions on my end, Delegate. Uh... And and uh, Senator, yeah, I just I just have a quick question for Andrew. Um, you mentioned the flood maps that are referenced. Um, I take it those are federal flood maps. And do you know the last time they were updated? I believe it's on a rolling cycle. I think it was, um, I think I saw it for 2021. Actually, they're going to be rolling out maps for Baltimore City. Okay, good. That's uh, glad to hear they're, they're being updated. Yeah, it's uh, certainly, yeah, the continuing process of working on those flood maps. Okay. Okay, not seeing any other questions. Um, we might be able to give folks 15 minutes of their day back. Um, I wanna thank everybody, the, the Critical Area Commission, the Chesapeake Bay Commission, Andrew, thank you for your time. Um, and thank you members for being so engaged today and having these conversations. Um, this is our only meeting in the interim, I believe, uh, unless something pressing occurs. Otherwise, um, we will see you uh, all together again for the January session. Um, Delegate, any closing thoughts? No, I just like to echo your thanks to the presenters and everyone's engagement. And hopefully next year we can act, do an actual in-person site visit, uh, you know, if the you know, pandemic has receded by then. Right. Well, so thank you. And thank you to, to uh, the staff for making this run so smoothly today. We greatly appreciate that. Okay. All right, have a lovely afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye.